All right, it is the top of the hour. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Carson McPherson Kretzky and I'm a research associate with the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm so happy to welcome you to the Making Mitigation Work webinar series, which is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible through the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series, which was launched in 2019, highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. So before we begin, I want to share a few announcements. This forum will be recorded. The captioned video recording and presentation slides from today's webinar will be uh, posted online at the Natural Hazard Center website at hazards.colorado.edu. You can also find recordings from previous, previous events and supplemental material, materials, as well as gain access to many other free resources. So please go ahead and check those out after our meeting today. Uh, in a few moments, I'm going to turn the controls over to our speakers. But if at any point during the presentation you have a question or a comment, please go ahead and submit those to the chat function or the Q&A box. As you can see in the image, those are on the bottom bar of your Zoom box, uh, and you can enter those in either, either location, and I'll be monitoring those throughout. We are going to leave about 20 minutes or maybe a little bit more for questions at the end, so we do encourage you to add those while the speakers are talking and while you think of them. Uh, thanks to partnerships with the International Association of Emergency Managers, attending this webinar makes you eligible to receive one contact hour of emergency management training through IAEM. In order to receive this credit, you are required to attend the entire webinar session. Um, and if you fulfill that requirement, then you can please contact me at hazardcenter@colorado.edu to request your certificate. You can also visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the Trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. Now, I'm excited to introduce today's webinar, which is titled A Missing Ingredient adding capacity to the federal vulnerability mapping mix. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from three speakers who will discuss their study that compared the Council on Environmental Quality, Climate and Economic Justice, Justice Screening Tool and the Federal Emergency Management Agency Community Disaster Resilience Zones with Headwaters Economics Rural Capacity Index. They will dive specifically into how maps can be better developed and tailored to meet community needs. So please join me in welcoming our three speakers today to our mitigation, Making Mitigation Work webinar. We're excited to have two Bill Anderson Fund fellows presenting today. And for those of you who maybe don't know who the Bill Anderson Fund is, it's an organi organization whose mission is to expand the number of historically underrepresented professionals in the fields of hazards and disaster research and practice. So we're really excited to have them, as well as a representative from Headwaters Economics. So first, we have Tiff Cousins, who is a PhD student at Virginia Tech. She is a researcher who focuses on geographic information systems and natural hazards with experience in geophysics, geography, and urban planning. Cousins' research uses crowdsourced data for fluvial, fluvial flood mapping and modeling. Her career vision is to explore the application of GIS in disaster resilience and risk management. Next, we have Joseph Karanja, who is a PhD student at Arizona State University, and his research focuses on understanding the socioeconomic and biophysical drivers of heat vulnerability across multiple spatial and temporal scales and examines associated heat health outcomes. Additionally, Karanja investigates how different spatial analysis methods influence how we define vulnerability and make policies. His research intersects Research interests intersects with themes such as urban climate, biometeorology, scale, spatial statistics, and vulnerability science. We're also joined by Patty Hernandez, who is the co-founder and executive director of Headwater Economics, a company who aims to inform community, community decision-making and identify practical solutions by making complex data understandable, beautiful, and interactive. Hernandez has 20 years of experience in economic development research, community assistance, technology solutions, and nonprofit leadership. She's led Headwaters Economics development of highly regarded interactive data tools, such as neighborhoods at risk and wildfire risk to communities. These help communities adapt to climate change. 
With an interest in community development and equity, Hernandez has worked with a wide network of partners to identify and analyze relevant data for community planning and natural hazards, and to make that data easily accessible. So we are so excited to have these three here today, and I'm excited to turn it over to them to begin this conversation. So as a reminder, uh, feel free to add questions to the chat or the Q&A box as we're talking, because we're going to have a good amount of time for that after the presentation. So with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing. And Patty, you can take it over. Sounds great. Thank you for that intro, Carson. And hey, everybody, I'm really pleased to be here with you all today. All right. How about this? Look, looks great. Looking good? Yep. OK. So as Carson mentioned, I'm Patty Hernandez with Headwaters Economics. And I have a question for you. So what share of climate resilience uh, funding, federal climate resilience funding specifically, would you guess goes to interior states? So this middle part of the country shown in blue. If you want to have a specific program in mind, you can think of FEMA's uh, BRIC program, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, which is you know, their flagship climate resilience program. So if you want to take a guess, you can pop your answer into the chat. Maybe it's three quarters of the funding, half, a third, quarter. Yeah, not nearly enough. So how many of you had in mind less than a quarter? So the, the answer is um, actually only 16%. Headwaters Economics looked at successful uh, grant applications for the BRIC program, and we found that 84% of the funds were awarded to higher capacity communities on the East and West coasts. And in fact, across the board, looking across competitive federal grants and programs at EPA, USDA, HUD, DOE, and other agencies, they are really largely failing to build climate resilience in lower capacity parts of the country. But this is a solvable problem. There are actually thousands of communities, such as Three Forks, Montana, that despite having really few local government staff and limited resources, can tackle ambitious projects that reduce risks from climate-related disasters. So our nonprofit, Headwaters Economics, supported this particular community, Three Forks, in their successful efforts to secure the biggest FEMA flood mitigation assistance grant ever awarded to a Montana community. And they're using those funds to implement green infrastructure that alleviates flood risk across their entire community. And Headwaters Economics, now we've been around for 18 years and we've worked with more than 100 communities across the country on similar projects. So I wanna take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about how we approach that work alongside our partners at the Bill Anderson Fund, and importantly, why we believe that local capacity, so a community's ability to plan and implement municipal projects, why we believe that that local capacity is critical for determining need and allocating federal resources. So that you understand a little bit about where I'm coming from, I'm just gonna take a quick minute to introduce Headwaters Economics. And the work that we do, um, our nonprofit is both local in that we have community development projects on the ground and we work nationally on economic policy. What it looks like in practice is that we're, we're pretty frequently partnering with local governments to provide data and economic arguments and strategies and tools so that they can do things like pass wildfire resistant building codes or secure funding to reduce flood risk in vulnerable neighborhoods. And we're really passionate about improving outcomes in rural and underserved communities 
that had largely been missing out on opportunities to build climate resilience. Similar to all of you, we rely really heavily on partnerships to do this good work and have a big impact in the world. And Headwaters Economics and the Bill Anderson Fund are really like-minded in this way. So we have partnered to bring you this really important research that Tiff Cousins and Joseph Karanja will be sharing um, in the you know, kind of remainder of the slides. I have a few more to share with you. And as, Car as Carson you know, already mentioned, the Bill Anderson Fund, if you don't know this amazing organization, they are very much worth knowing. They work to expand um, underrepresented minority professionals in hazards and disaster work. And they do that through training and mentorship. And so Tiff and Joseph are two Bill Anderson Fund fellows who have contributed their expertise and, and knowledge to this research. So we've organized the information for you today in three parts. I'll wrap up my part by just providing a little bit more context, kind of the why behind the project. I'm gonna pass the baton to Joseph, who's gonna share national findings, and then Tiff is gonna round us out with regional findings. All right, so diving right in. The study essentially compares three maps each of which offers a pretty unique perspective of what it means to be at risk and in need. So Tiff and Joseph were able to analyze how local capacity as depicted in Headwaters Economics Capacity Map, how that aligns with these two federal climate vulnerability maps shown on the right. And while there's many federal vulnerability maps um, out there today, these two in particular were selected because they really are being used to help allocate billions of dollars across hundreds of federal programs for climate resilience, housing, energy, infrastructure. And what we suspected was that these federal vulnerability maps were doing a better job representing need where local governments have fairly high capacity. So you might picture, just as an example, um, that the neighborhood shown on the left, but that lower capacity places, as an example, the one pictured on the right, are remain underrepresented in federal vulnerability maps. And while this current depiction of need isn't necessarily incorrect, it does feel incomplete. Certainly our staff at Headwaters Economics who spend a lot of time supporting flood and wildfire risk reduction work in very low capacity communities really felt that capacity may be somewhat of a missing ingredient in the federal vulnerability mapping mix. So I'll take a quick minute to provide a brief overview of the three maps that were compared in this project. Headwaters Economics Capacity Index was created with support from NOAA and from charitable foundations. It's a national map of local government jurisdictions, so cities, towns, townships, counties. It uses uh, nationally available data to estimate the ability of local governments to plan and implement infrastructure and municipal projects, including importantly, climate adaptation projects. So in the capacity map, need is defined as a lack of local government staff and expertise that are really important for planning and implementing infrastructure and climate resilience projects. And importantly, when we've done analyses with uh, this map, we've been able to learn that these data explain more variation in which communities are successful at securing federal funds and resources, more variation than population, which is not all that surprising. Um, you know, there is some correlation with, you know, small populations versus large metropolitan areas, but ca uh, capacity is more nuanced than that. There's more uh, factors at play. As for the federal maps in our comparison, I suspect many of you are familiar with them. 
So I'll just give a very quick overview. And Carson already helps help, you know, kind of set the stage with this. The climate and economic justice screening tool, often shortened to CGEST, shown in yellow here, was created by an executive order from Biden to support the Justice 40 initiative. And then FEMA's community disaster resilience zones, shown in blue, which is often shortened to CDARS, was created at the direction of Congress and is now actually written into the Stafford Act. So this mapping effort is really going to have some staying power. Both of these maps are national maps of census tracts. And in both maps, the metrics focus pretty heavily on identifying populations that are vulnerable to disasters based on factors like poverty, exposure to pollution, and economic losses from past disasters. Okay. So now I get to pass it to Joseph, who is going to walk us through how, you know, a little bit about how we compare these maps and what we learned at the national level. So Joseph, I'm ready to advance the slides and you can jump on in. Uh, thank you, Patty, for the introduction. So I'll start by explaining some of the technical consideration we addressed when comparing three vulnerability maps. And picking from what Patty has mentioned, we had three layers of concern to us, and these include the CDAS, the CGIS, and the Rural Capacity Index. The numbers to the left of the screen represent the universe of, or total counts of respective geographies for the entire US. The geographies of interest are communities, county, and tracts. So for example, in terms of interpreting, we have got a total of 31,151 communities 3,143 counties, 84,112 tracts. It is important to take note of the universe as they help in contextualizing derived percentages and proportions in subsequent slides. And also we adopted multiple geographies of analysis, which provides a multifaceted perspective for identifying similarities and differences for the different vulnerability maps and the rural capacity index, which is crucial for decision makers. More so, we did have a sensor relationship file that, was, that harmonized data layers to the same vintage to allow for standardized comparisons over time. Next slide, please. So notably from this slide, the number of tracks identified as at risk and in need differ greatly between the CGIST and CDAS maps. We identified 483 CDAS designated tracks and 29,688 CGES designated tracks. Therefore, only 2% of the CGES designated tracks are identified as CEDARS. It is important to note that CEDARS designated tracks get prioritized funding for climate resilience and mitigation. Both CEDARS and CGES designation provide the geographic focus for financial and technical assistance for implementation of resilience projects. Therefore, it is critical to determine their work they want to determine the extent they incorporate uh, community capacity in the vulnerability uh, maps. Next slide, please. So this chart shows that the vast majority of communities that intersect one or more feeders tracks have high capacity. So we, we identified 182 communities that intersected feeders tracks out of a total of uh, 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 we had uh, we have uh, so many communities, but only 182 communities intersected CEDARS tracks. In fact, a high capacity communities is 14 times more likely to be identified as CEDARS compared to a low capacity communities. Therefore, given that finding, there is evidence of special mismatch between capacity and CEDARS tracks. Next slide, please. We found similar results for the CGEST maps that only 4,060 communities intersected CGEST tracks. A high capacity community is seven times more likely to be identified by CGEST for federal support compared to a low capacity communities. Specifically, the 4060 communities that intersected CGEST tracks represent only 13% of communities. And out of these 13%, just 10% were designated as low capacity. Next slide, please. 
In this slide and in the next one, we'll review the results of our county level analysis. From this uh, slide, only 9% of US counties intersected with CDAS trucks. More so, 19% of the intersecting counties were designated as low capacity. And therefore, at this moment, it's imperative to note that even with a change in geography, whether you're considering communities or counties, low capacity geographies are underrepresented in federal vulnerability maps. Next slide, please. So from this chart, the representation of low, medium, and high capacity counties is more even for the CGS map. However, 67% of the counties with CGS truck still fall in the medium to high capacity range. So out of the 22,564 counties that intersected CGS truck, only 830 counties representing about 2% intersected with CGS trucks, which were considered low capacity. Next slide, please. So given the findings from the previous slides, we summarize our findings as follows. Regardless of geography, that is whether we are considering communities or counties, low capacity locations are underrepresented in federal vulnerability maps. Secondly, the level of spatial aggregation or geography influences basic statistics. And then just a fraction of communities and counties intersect with either CDAS or CGS trucks. More so, or more importantly, a tiny fraction of these intersections align with low capacity designations. So you'll ask yourself, what are the implications of uh, our findings? So capacity is a critical dimension of need that has been overlooked in federal vulnerability maps. And the inclusion of capacity is integral for strategic prioritization of grants and infrastructure investment. As I conclude, it's important to integrate vulnerability mapping with capacity determination for strategic prioritization of resources, which can bolster specially targeted interventions and funding. Thank you for listening to me. Hello. All right, Hello. Time. Yeah. off to you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, I am Tiff. I will be talking to you, talking you through the regional findings for this study. So to orient you, uh, these are the regions that I'll be using to discuss the regional findings. From left to right, we have the Pacific Coast, the West or Interior West, uh, the Midwest, the Gulf Coast, the Great Lakes, uh, the North, uh, the, I mean the South and the Northeast. Although it's not shown on the map, Alaska and Hawaii are part of the Pacific Coast region. Next, please. So as Joseph mentioned before, there are relatively few CDARs tracked, specifically 483. And there is a fair distribution among the regions, consistently making up a less than 2% of each regions of tracks. So each region has about 2% of tracks that are identified as CDARs. By comparison, there are a larger number of CGEST tracks, specifically 29,688 tracks. And as you can see from this bar chart, they also have a fair distribution among the regions. But CGIS tracks making up the largest share of tracks in the Gulf Coast. So let me help, let me help you orient this map. Every dot on this map represents a CDARS tract, and the color of the dots represents the community, the capacity of the communities they intersect. The white dots on the CDARS tracks are CDAR tracks that do not intersect a community. In other words, these white dots occur outside of municipal or incorporated boundaries. And what you may have noticed is there are very few dark red dots. Those are CDAR tracks that intersect low capacity communities. 
In fact, looking at the numbers, we see that across the board, the majority of communities that intersect CDAR tracks have high capacity. This is true in every single region. The Midwest has the highest intersection of low capacity communities at 13% of tracks. However, given that 72% of Midwestern communities have low capacity, Midwest communities with low capacity are actually very underrepresented in the CDARS map. Now, we are gonna look at a map of CGIS tracks and their capacity of communities that intersect them. As a reminder, there are more CGIS tracks than there are CDARS tracks. So naturally, we have a lot more dots on the map overall. And some things to notice, there are still a fair number of white dots. That is CGIS tracks that do not intersect a community boundary. And there are great many, there are many pink dots, which are CDIS tracks that intersect high capacity communities. And here you see by numbers, consistent with the CDARS regional comparisons, we found that majority of CDAR CGS tracks intersect high capacity communities. This is especially true in the Northeast, Pacific Coast, and Great Lakes region. Next, we are going to look at how these tracks compare to counties' capacity. Here, every dot on the map represents a CDARS tract and the color of the dots represents the capacity of the county that they intersect. Yay for us, there are no white dots at all on this map because every dot will uh, intersect a county, every tract will intersect a county. Um, and we may have noticed that there are still very few dark red dots as compared to pink dots. Uh, yes, thank you. And in fact, looking at the numbers, we see across the board, the majority of counties that intersect CDARS tracks have a high or medium capacity. The Midwest has the highest intersection of low capacity counties at approximately 40% of its tracks. However, given that 65% of the Midwestern counties have low capacity, the low capacity counties in the Midwest are still underrepresented in the CDARS map. Lastly, we're gonna look at the map of CGES tracks and the capacity of counties that they intersect. Again, there are more CDARS, CGES tracks than there are CDARS tracks. So there will be more dots overall. Again, there's still more pink dots than there are red dot, dark red dots, which suggests there are more CDARS, CGES tracks that intersect high capacity communities. Next, please. Thank you. So here, looking at the numbers, consistent with the CDARS regional comparisons, we found that majority of CGES tracks intersect high or medium capacity counties. This is especially true in the Pacific Coast, Great Lakes, and Northeast regions. Next. To summarize it all, on the community level, the Northeast, Pacific Coast, and Great Lakes consistently have the highest share of tracks with CDARS and CGES designations, and the majority are high capacity. On the county level analysis, it reinforces the disproportionate share of CDARS and CGES tracks that are intersecting with high or medium capacity places. Lastly, per region, the share of low capacity places represented by the CDARS and CGES maps is less than expected. For example, nearly three quarters of the Midwest communities rank as, a low, as low capacity, but only 3% of CGES tracks and 13% of CDARS tracks in the Midwest intersect with low capacity communities. These findings reinforce the point 
that these two federal vulnerability maps do not currently consider capacity. So what does this mean? What does this mean for resilience? These federal maps are meant for climate resilience, to build climate resilience. And in the broad sense, resilience is the ability to bounce back from a disaster and come out a little bit better than before. However, if localities lack the capacity to be resilient and then are overlooked in federal maps, then we're building resilience disproportionately. National resilience is a reflection of local resilience. Next slide, please. So if you're interested in learning more, we published a summary of the research online at Headwaters Economics website. You can scan the QR code to get right to the page. And Patty's also dropping the link in the chat. The web story includes a great infographic that helps explain our results. And we also use the web page to share links to journal articles we are working on once they are published. Thank you all so much for your interest in this topic. And we have plenty of time for Q&A. So you definitely feel free to reach out to any of us after the webinar today. Thank you, Tiff, Joseph, and Patty for that excellent presentation and uh, keeping it perfectly to the timing. That was that was amazing. Well, we have a great amount of time. We have about 20 minutes or so for questions, and we've been getting a bunch coming in. So I've been monitoring those in the chat um, and definitely a lot of interest in this topic. So that's exciting. Um, so I think before we dive into maybe some of the, the meatier questions, I think it might be helpful for folks if you maybe define a little bit or, or remind us how the capacity is being measured. There were a couple questions about um, how, are you, how are you determining capacity and can you just talk a little bit more about that in terms of the headwaters map? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so it was probably about three years ago that Headwaters developed the first version of the capacity map. I saw that a uh, link uh, got dropped into the chat. And since then, we've been improving and evolving and uh, you know trying to bring more scientific rigor to that definition. The, the principle that's probably most important to keep in mind is that the goal that we had in mind, of course, you can define capacity in many different ways, but the goal that we had in mind was to focus on the ability of communities and specifically local governments to plan, fund, implement, and maintain infrastructure and climate resilience and climate adaptation projects. This stems from the fact that Headwaters Economics is working you know, across the country um, to help communities that are fairly small in size advance flood and wildfire ri risk reduction projects. And you know, there are barriers and opportunities that we face and you know, feel kind of firsthand in partnership with, with those communities. So we wanted to make a map that really sheds light on this aspect of need, the local government capacity and their ability to make headway on climate adaptation projects. So um, you can go to that website and you'll see that there are several categories of indicators that we, you know, we sought national data to represent um, this kind of local government staffing and expertise as a concept, institutional capacity, economic opportunity, and um, like civic engagement and education as well. So there's these kind of categories of capacity that we tried to represent with national data. And you can read more about the methodology um, that we used to produce that national map. The only other thing I'll say about that map is that we have um, done some statistical analyses to look at the degree to which um, it uh, is related to outcomes in terms of the ability of communities to successfully secure federal resources. And there is a very strong relationship 
and it has more explanatory power than population. So um, hopefully that's a, just a, enough background on how we defined capacity. I saw that there were a lot of questions too about what is a CGES tract and what is a CDARS tract. So maybe people you know, popped in a little bit late or I zipped through it too quickly, but you know, essentially the entire study that we did was looking at the alignment of capacity with two very influential federal vulnerability maps. One is, is referred to shorthand as CGEST, <clears throat> and that's the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. And the other one is referred to shorthand as CDARS. These are both federal maps that are guiding billions of dollars of investments in climate resilience. And that second one, CDARS, is Community Disaster Resilience Zones. So we wanted, the whole premise of the study was to look at the degree to which capacity is reflected in those two very influential and powerful federal vulnerability map products. Excellent. Thanks so much, Patty, for that explanation. That was super helpful. Um, all right, let me see what other questions we had here that came in. Um, Heather Hilliard asked, uh, the FEMA NRI, which I don't know what that stand for, stands for, um, got a lot of feedback on similarly continuing the institutional bias to help hire resources for resource county slash area. How do we get FEMA and others to open the data sources and use these type of findings so we stop favoring funding to those who have capacity? So whoever wants to field that one. I'm curious, Tiff and Joseph, if anything is occurring to you on how to reach FEMA with these findings, I can follow up if you want to share any, any thoughts. I think I can give it a trial. Um, so I believe uh, through dissemination of our findings, that could be a crucial starting point for getting FEMA uh, to understand uh, the implications of uh, missing out on capacity when it comes to vulnerability determination. And also there are plans to publish our work and I think that is a critical dissemination pathway. And I think that will likely grasp the attention of FEMA. So having this conversation uh, in such avenues such as this uh, webinar, I believe this will initiate our conversations around these issues. Thank you. Anything else anyone wants to add there? Tiff, any, any follow-up? Not much more, uh, just that, that yes. Uh, having these conversations and we are working on multiple manuscripts to come out. And so hopefully that will uh, continue the conversation further and people can also build on that as well. Yeah. And, you know, I do think that looking at these comparisons objectively, publishing them and circulating them, you know, I know that um, Headwaters Economics has really positive relationships with the mapping teams and the uh, kind of leadership at FEMA's mitigation division. And they, this radar is, their, this topic rather is on their radar and um, you know they have um, been working really hard and will get a chance to update their CDARS map product when they have to stick with their initial definition for the full five-year initial cycle but um, they're they're always thinking ahead of what that next iteration is going to look like and how to continue to evolve and improve it. Um, so this kind of objective um, analysis, I think, will be really useful to them, just as Joseph and Tip reiterated. Excellent. Well, we'll be excited to read read your manuscripts and, and materials when they come out. Um, OK, Stephen Decatur asked, uh, Cedars heavily focuses on raw losses instead of looking at per capita losses. I imagine areas with higher loss, higher nominal losses have more high value assets and would generally have higher capacity. 
Have you looked at whether or not a change in the CEDARS met methodology to account for per capita losses instead of raw losses would align better with the capacity data? Um, Tiff and Joseph, we've looked at this a little bit. I don't know if you have um, thoughts on this. I'm happy to jump in, but I want to give you a chance first if you if you've done any work or, or this has kind of crossed your mind. The precise answer to that on my end would be no, I haven't uh, had a chance to look at a change of how a change of methodology uh, will affect uh, the uh, similarities or differences between capacity and the existing federal vulnerability maps. What we did specifically was to advance the conversation on to what extent the current vulnerability maps align with uh, capacity. And I think the question that uh, the, has been posted provides an avenue for subsequent analysis, which will provide probably uh, much more interesting facts. Yeah, and I think that there's, you know, historically, um, whether you express it as absolute losses or per capita losses, um, the bottom line is that low capacity communities come out behind. Um, you can think about it this way. I mean, really, I would like us to get away from measuring impacts and need and risk by quantifying dollars, you know, lost. Like, I can see that decades ago, economists thought that this was a good idea because there's, you know, inherently you want the federal government to have fiscal responsibility and how money is doled out. But any place where you see economic losses as a measure of need tends to prioritize high property value areas. Whatever you use as a divisor, you know, high property value areas, um, you know, tend to come out ahead. And so I think it would be quite interesting to experiment, experiment with iterations of that variable, but I'd almost like us to just get beyond that um, and quantify need and risk, um, you know, in different ways. The, the problem, as we've seen with benefit cost analyses, is that if you make eligibility and you know the allocation of resources tied to where you know you're going to see fewer economic impacts you you just tend to be um prioritizing urban and often affluent areas Thank you. Um, this next question, I think maybe Tiff could take on. So can you talk about why some of the tracks don't overlap with communities at all? And how how would that be avoided in future iterations? If, if at all. Um, yes, and this could also help answer Aaron Flores' question. Uh, so the data source for the communities that was used, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, is uh, census designated places. And so those are just small places around the United States that have certain boundaries. So for example, New York City is a census, in, uh, could be, is a community, right? And then there may be a spatial gap because it's Nassau County right next door. And there's another census designated place within Nassau County. So in that gap, if a track falls within that gap, spatially, it does not intersect with a community. Um, if that helps answer your question. So it's without, it's not in the boundaries of a census designated, designated place, municipal or incorporated area. Thank you, that was great. Um, let's see, we have, so someone asked, why are communities' true capacities not being reflected in the CEDARS and CGES tracked maps? Do you think it's something to do with the available vulnerability index? Joseph, um, 
I saw your mic go off or your mute go off for a second. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, okay. I think the question speaks to the larger challenges when it comes to the development and construction of indices. All these indices vary in terms of the geographies of concern, the selection of indices, the methodology for the construction of the indices. And so most of the time you often end up with the uh, the similarity among these indices, and probably that explains as to why we've got uh, structural differences uh, within these indices. Great. Um, one question that maybe I kind have, of, oh, go I ahead. Have one addition to that, Carson, which is that if you look at some of the indicators of risk and need within the federal vulnerability maps, you have, we already talked about economic losses. You know, right away that's gonna that's gonna lend itself to a more high population density, high property value situation. We also have, because legitimately just the Justice 40 initiative is environmental justice focused, they have pollution as a major driver. And in some cases you have like traffic pollution. Well, I mean, you, you can see that some of the indicators are more urban centric. Um, again, this is not just rural versus urban because capacity is more nuanced than that, but you can start to see how certain variables that um, are more familiar to people living in urban environments, predispose these maps to like bias them towards higher capacity, you know, metropolitan type, you know, highlighting the needs in those communities where there absolutely is need. So this is not an either or argument, you know, this is an and situation. <laughs> Right, right. We're almost making clear there's like a disclaimer that it's like we are we are elevating these factors and, you know, focusing here so that people are aware of of what is all bringing being brought into that into that fold. Um, one thing I always think about with map tools like this, especially when it's decision making, is just the foundational data that they're built off of. And we know from the 2020 census there were a lot of issues um, with gathering representative data, especially from minority communities and other groups. And so for, for tools that are trying to measure vulnerability that sometimes are based off incomplete data, I, I, I guess I'm curious to hear your thoughts on just some of the potential issues around data availability and trying to represent these really complicated um, indexes. Maybe Joseph or Tiff, if you wanna, if you wanna take those. Um, I think I can partly answer your question. I think we've got challenges when it comes to represent how representative the data is, and even how representative the geographies of interest are. Uh, in my own, my personal opinion is that we mostly use census data for determination of vulnerability, which might not be the operational scale at which vulnerability exists. And also mm -hmm. most of these sensors are related variables. I don't think they were initially or they were meant to be used for determination of vulnerability. So over time as scientists or researchers, we've often ended up using what, whatever is available rather than what is desirable in the determination of vulnerability. Uh, along with that also data vintages um, could also is also a problem. One thing that we ran into was, as Joseph explained in the methodology section, was uh, CGEST is on the 2010 census geography mm -hmm. and CDARS is on the 2020 census geography. So the, the trying to align those things, yes, they're both tracks, but trying to align what this what one track was in 2010 is not the same may not be the same track as it is in 2020. It could be have broken up into three or combined with another track. So even keeping track of that, no pun intended, um, is is another problem with all with um, different data sources and what is available. 
Yeah. Wow. That makes me just so impressed with the work you guys did to just tease out some of the, the complicated nature of the information you were looking at. So, so impressive. And that actually leads into another a question from Aaron Flores um, asking about qualitative data or uh, so that he asked, I'm curious about any plans for qualitative analysis. For example, what are perceptions about federal funding in some of these overlooked communities? Do some communities even want federal government stepping in and offering support or might there be distrust in those communities? So yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I can maybe offer some useful perspective since we have, you know, Headwaters Economics has teams of people doing the boots on the ground community assistance work in really conservative, really rural communities. And um, when there are disasters, uh, communities want resources. They want resources to reduce that risk. They want resources to recover. Um, they, a lot of these communities obviously are also really aware that um, they're frequently unsuccessful in their proposals. And when they are successful navigating the, those proposal processes and the administration and compliance of those uh, grant awards um, is nearly impossible for communities with very few local government staff, which does cause some not to apply for help um, or for resources rather. So I think that there's this really large question that many, um, you know, many people thinking about how we scale up climate adaptation are grappling with, which is, you know, it's inherently tied to the analysis that we did, but I tried to frame it with that three forks story where they're doing a really ambitious um, green infrastructure project. They got remapped into the flood zone, their entire community, uh, you know, so they have much higher flood risk than was previously understood. And in the face of that, um, even with their limited staff, they know they have a problem to solve. They just need the partnerships, the state support, the federal support um, to do the work, but they are capable. And, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking about what are those principles that actually function for providing support? What are the partnerships? And it's a really rich area of, of learning, I think, with a tremendous amount of potential. Thank you. Um, and those that example really speaks to just the real implications of these map updates and how they're really affecting communities on the ground, um, which, yeah, it's just so helpful to have that as an illustration. Um, Given our conversation a little bit about data sets and, and timing of the data, um, going to Christopher Young's question, has anything been done using longitudinal data to see change over time for these kinds of indexes or indices? I bet Tiff and Joseph might have some insight for us about what the barriers and opportunities are with spatial data and longitudinal analyses. Are there like, are there any thoughts that are occurring to you about, you know, what, yeah, what ideas come up for you about the potential or, or the difficulties? I like this question and even the question before. Um, so, it's, I, I find it interesting because I am from New York City. And so we, you know, that we have the flood risk, we high, high flood risk. And so looking at this analysis from not only like a researcher standpoint, but also like someone who lives it um, all the time, it's kind of like, wow, it, it makes sense. Cause it's just like, yeah, we can get the federal dollars, but every time it rains, it still floods like it rained 
like it did the last time. Um, so I would love to delve deeper into that, that quantitative, the qualitative, like what do people think outside of the research, the practitioner academy, like just any and everybody. Um, and one thing that's been like going around in my mind is, you know, we talk about capacity and we talk about these federal vulnerability maps. And so, you know, like, okay, what about people's experiences, past experiences, how that plays into capacity as well. Also, um, from literature, you know, participation also increases social capacity, institutional capacity. So how does that also play into all of this? So overall, I appreciate your questions. Um, that's as much as I have right now, but if you would like to talk more, yes, uh, I love these questions. Yeah, any other thoughts anyone wants to share on that? Joseph, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Just to add on what Tiff has mentioned, I believe there's a lot of uh, quantitative uncertainty that is associated with longitudinal analysis. The geographies change over time and also the description of these variables change over time. So great uncertainty is introduced uh, even with the changes of geography while at the same time, the construction of these indices also is associated with uncertainty. So we've got two levels of uncertainty introduced when you are looking at it from a longitudinal perspective. I've come across studies that have tried to do a validation of the indices against outcomes. However, one of the key challenges that always arises is should we validate these indices against small, persistent, chronic outcomes or large major events? And this is an ongoing debate. Thank you, Joseph. All right, we have time for, for one last question. Um, and I wanted to bring this one up. So I'd be curious to know, is the capacity map uh, that Headwaters developed currently being used by government agencies or other organizations? And if so, how are they accessing it and using it? I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so I think it has much more potential. And I hope that if you're interested in this topic, you'll help spread the word. Um, I one time had somebody tell me that Headwaters Economics was the best kept secret. And I was like, oh, that's like not, you know, not what I wanted to hear. I think we're small but mighty. So the um, the USDA, who, who Headwaters Economics has had long standing, like more than a decade um, partnership with, is actively using the capacity data for their new BIL funded community wildfire defense grants program. They're using it in, in evaluation as they do iterations of grant making to evaluate who they're reaching and then they're actively using it to shape outreach so that they you know, are taking active steps to reach more lower capacity communities. That's the only federal agency yet that we have been actively um, working with um, uh, with these data. There's many state agencies around the country. A few that come to mind are the first one to, to start using it for a small grants program was in Michigan, their Office of Rural Development. Um, there's a similar body of work being done in Washington state, interestingly, by their office of, I think it's like recreation and, and um, conservation, but they do economic development grant making. And um, just recently, North Carolina started using it for education and outreach purposes, their office, office of climate resilience. And um, we stood up a web map service for them with these data. So you can get the data spatially, you can get it in spreadsheets. We're just trying to put it out there um, as much as possible. So people can do research with it, they can evaluate how to use it. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much uh, for, it, for that answer and for all the other answers. That was just such a fantastic presentation. And I feel like this topic is only becoming more and more important as we continue to see these tools you know, really being used in decision making for for such big, big decisions as getting funding to these communities. So it's just it's so critical. And thank you all so much. 
All right, so I'm going to just share a few things uh, before we sign off here. And I just want to, again, just give gratitude to Joseph, Tiff, and Patty, and the many others who have contributed to this effort. We also want to thank uh, FEMA and the National Science Foundation for making this webinar series possible. We're so grateful for all of you in the audience who joined today and provided such wonderful questions. Uh, and before we close, I'm just going to have a few brief announcements. So please remember to contact us at hazardcenter at colorado.edu if you plan to request continuing education credits that are offered through IAEM. Additionally, we hope you will save the date for the next Making Mitigation Work webinar, which will be on Tuesday, August 13th from 11 to noon Mountain Time, and to learn more about what is happening in this world of mitigation practice and research. We hope you will subscribe to updates through the Natural Hazard Center website so you can receive notifications about upcoming webinars and other resources, uh, including announcements about uh, various events that we're having. Um, and now on the behalf of the entire team at the Natural Hazard Center, we want to thank Tiff, Joseph, Patty again for this wonderful presentation, uh, as well as everyone who joined us today. We look forward to seeing you in August or in July if you're attending the Natural Hazards Workshop. So thank you all so much, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.